We also welcome our community partners, allies, and colleagues from other professions joining us in our celebration and who share our mission of social justice and our commitment to populations of the Southwest. This is the sixth gathering in our month long celebration of social work. From workshops, career fairs, and self care, all of these events are celebrations as they serve to deepen our knowledge and skills to advance social justice. But today, we simply gather to reflect and acknowledge our community and to say thank you to those who have supported, challenged, served, inspired, taught, and coached us this year. Like I said, if you could do us a favor and mute your mics to avoid background noise, but make sure you use the chat box to keep the conversation going throughout the next couple of hours. Say hi, tell us who you are and where you're joining us from. If you're a graduate, tell us your grad year. If you're a student, tell us what you're learning, what year you're in. Share some highlights from your year. Congratulate a colleague. We wanna see you and the incredible work you do for clients and communities every day. So if you're comfortable keeping your mic on then we, or your camera on, then we get to see you too. But if not, we understand. So go ahead and start using that chat and letting us know who you are, where you're from, and some highlights from your year. It's motorcycle. All right. Um, the theme of this year's celebration is the time is right for social work. Be sure to keep the conversation going this month on social media about why it's the right time for our profession. We have our hashtag social work month 2022 and hashtag right time for social work. As we acknowledge the two year anniversary of the pandemic, woo, can we all just take a collective breath, inhale, exhale, woo, to that. Now, more than ever, Social work is vital to promoting the health and well being of all people. Consider that at a time when mental health care is needed most, our profession represents the nation's largest group of clinically trained mental health practitioners. We are on the front lines helping people overcome crisis while using our collective power as a profession to advocate for changes in systems and policies. But Social workers have been an integral part of our nation for decades. Social workers played key roles in the civil rights and women's rights movements and pushed for social programs we now take for granted, including the minimum wage, a 40 hour work week, social security and Medicare and many more. The time is always right for social work. More people are entering the field because the life affirming services that social workers provide are needed more than ever. <coughs> social work remains the only profession in our nation de dedicated to studying and advancing basic human rights and social care for those most likely to be excluded from society's resources. And I believe it's time, maybe past time, for us to reflect on the aspects of who we are as individuals and as a profession, on the ways we have room for growth in the areas we study and practice to ensure we are living up to who we say we are as a profession. This month, we celebrate the ways our profession has committed to our core values and continue to reflect on the areas we can do better. And for over 60 years, the School of Social Work at ASU has been committed to educating the next generation of practitioners ready to join this essential workforce. Embracing the ASU Charter to take fundamental responsibility for the social, cultural, and overall health of the communities it serves, we are proud to train practitioners dedicated to social work practice with populations of the Southwest. And we are proud to call Arizona home. Out of respect for the first people who called Arizona home and to honor our original stewards of the land where our campuses now reside, we invite Lourdes Pereira, uh, Miss Indigenous ASU 2020 to 2022, and Chris Sharp, Clinical Assistant Professor at the School of Social Work, to offer a land acknowledgement.
big dash, and in a chicky word this prena, and you were here to rap and chew a mess, or muck anjit, or muck chuck and chuck, have a geese, gigik them, and eat a mashtam, arshon, have a good hamashtamakur. So, good day, everyone. My name is Lord this prena, I'm here to rap them in you. I may come from the San Lucie district of the Don of the Nation. I'm a double major here at ASU in Justice Studies and American Indian Studies, and it's an honor to be here with all of you today. I'm going to continue with a uh, land acknowledgement. Arizona State University's campuses are situated on the homelands of many tribal nations, in particular the Otham and Peeposh, and acknowledge the many indigenous communities who reside in this territory. Skigeek is the Otham word that is now known as Phoenix, which was settled in 1881 by occupiers. The ancestors of the Otham, the Huhukam, created canals and, utilizing, and utilized surround, surrounding rivers that are the basis of the current irrigation system that feeds Skigeek today. These waterways have always been the foundation and the livelihood of the residents within the valley. Throughout the past 500 years, the impact of colonialism has been detrimental to indigenous lands and languages, affecting their livelihood. Many people who live in the Southwest are unaware of this history. Furthermore, ASU's indigenous student community consists of over 3,000 strong, not including faculty, staff, and alumni who continue to thrive, educate, and advocate for the strengthening of indigenous ways of life. As the Otham call it, Hindog, the way of life for the Otham, encompassing their culture, traditions, identity, and being. As Otham and all indigenous peoples, our identity is tied to the land, like our own bodies. We must respect and care for it. We urge everyone to do the same. We challenge you to educate yourself about the history and the communities who continue to thrive today. Moving forward, it is vital to honor and respect that you are always on indigenous land. Sapa, thank you. It's an honor to be here with all of you. It is such an inspiration, all the work you all are doing, and congratulations to all the award recipients. Sapa, hugadai. Hello, my name is Chris Sharp. Thank you for joining us um, for this Social Work Month event. I'm very happy to be here. I'm a citizen of the Colorado River Indian tribes of the Mojave people, um, descended from the Frog Clan of the Mojave people. And I'm also alum of the school, uh, earned my MSW in 2011 and my MPA degree as in the dual degree program. I'm a PAC graduate. And both of my parents were alumni from the school as well. So it's uh, definitely a, a proud family legacy. Um, I direct the Office of American Indian Projects and we're actually, um, uh, we're established in 1977. So we're entering the 45th year. We're very proud of that. And we're proud to continue our partnerships with tribal programs, our support for students through provision of culturally safe space and spaces and empowerment of students through the through leadership development. Um, so I wanna uh, acknowledge that the uh, Lourdes provided the um, land acknowledgement that was developed by VOSA, which is the Voices of Autumn Students. And I'm going to provide our um, land acknowledgement officially um, approved by the school and the faculty. And we have this at the beginning of our, at the, um, within our master syllabus, syllabi template. So if you're in a social work class, you will see this and, um, and read this uh, whenever you take the classes and read the syllabi. The School of Social Work acknowledges with respect that the physical locations of the Arizona State University School of Social Work are within the ancestral homelands of those American Indian tribes that have sustained connections to its lands and waters since time immemorial, including the Akamel Atum, the Peeposh, the Kachan, and the Dahana Atum peoples. It's more, this acknowledgement is more than a statement, but a way of setting ourselves as social workers and acknowledging the peoples that are indigenous to these lands. And the fact that anywhere we go in this beautiful land, we know as a Southwest that there are indigenous ties. In Arizona, we have 22 tribes and a multitude of tribal peoples um, in New Mexico, Southern California, Utah, Southern Nevada. And as you cross the border uh, into Sonora and Baja California, there's indigenous peoples there as well. So the acknowledgement represents the story of resilience and it must be told and honored through our commitment to empowerment, allyship and inclusion. And that's what I believe um, will help us truly uh, achieve equity within our society. So as social workers, it is essential to acknowledge indigenous peoples by partnering with our tribes and urban Indian organizations to overcome many of the challenges 
that face our people. It's equally important to focus on empowerment through strengths-based and resilience-informed social work practice and policies. Acknowledgement and empowerment can only happen through our actions, through inclusion of indigenous perspectives and de dedicated dedication of resources towards our stated commitments. ASU has de demonstrated commitment through the hiring of amazing indigenous social work educators. And I feel comfortable in speaking on their behalf that we are continuously advocating for all students that get a social work degree from ASU to learn about tribal sovereignty, the federal trust relationship, indigenous rights, indigenous ways of knowing and healing, and the Indian Child Welfare Act. We must continue to engage in these efforts across the school of social work curriculum. I believe that our school has been a leading example nationally through those efforts of our staff, our field office, faculty, administration, and community advisors. So I thank you all for your dedication and being inclusive and this acknowledgement is part of that. So once again, thank you. And I'll turn it back over to Associate Dean Crota. Thank you, Chris and Lourdes. The School of Social Work is proud to call Arizona home, and we are proud to be part of the nation's premier academic institution for students committed to social change, the Watts College of Public Service and Community Solutions. We think social work plays an important and integral role, often supporting, sometimes challenging, in designing just and effective solutions with the community and alongside our interdisciplinary colleagues at Watts College. We now invite the Dean of Watts College and fellow social worker and alumni, Cynthia Leitz, to offer a welcome. Dean Leitz. And I'm going to remind Dean Leitz to unmute her mic. I just saw it. Oh my goodness. It's been a while since I made that mistake, but it was about time for it to happen again. I was just so enthusiastic to wish you all happy social work month uh, for our faculty, our staff, our students, our alumni, community partners who are on um, for this event event. We're just thrilled to have you join us. Couldn't be more proud to spend some time with you on a Friday afternoon to recognize a field that is extremely close to my heart. Obviously, no, in Watts no. College, we are fundamentally We're making committed an addition. To, sorry about that. A little bit of an interruption there. Um, super proud as a college to advance the mission of social work, but with social work being my um, home unit, I am particularly excited about being able to celebrate uh, the amazing colleagues who are being recognized today, but I also want to recognize all of you, all who have and continue to work in social work uh, to advance the mission and the core values of the field are making a difference in the world, and we're very proud to share this time with you today. All right, so just briefly, I thought it might be nice to start the time with a story, um, and initially it may not make quite sense uh, how it relates to our event today, but I think by the time we get to the end, you'll see its relationship to what we're celebrating here. So some of you know that my research focuses on resilience. Initially, I was focused very much on looking at the process um, and protective factors that help vulnerable families overcome adversity, loss, and challenges. And more recently, that work has moved to looking at young people who are pursuing a college education and the protective factors in the process that helps activate and cultivate the process of resilience for them. So this story is actually related to a, a research study I did um, several years ago that looked at the process of resilience for families, for parents in particular, who had lost custody of their children to the public child welfare system. Um, unfortunately, uh, it's an uncommon outcome for folks to both return, have a return home and also keep kids home um, because of high reentry rates um, into the child welfare system. So we were interested to know in this study, how is it that some families who go through this difficult experience are able to successfully achieve their case plan, ultimately um, have their children return back to their care and ultimately keep them there? So we identified a sample of families who had done just that. They all um, rated in the healthy level on the family assessment device. They all had had the history of a child welfare case plan. They had achieved reunification and they had to have been back together as a family for at least two years to be eligible for the study. But the mean number of years that people were back together was over seven years. So these were families that accomplished a great deal of change under very difficult circumstances, demonstrating an example of resilience. 
One of the moms in this study shared something that was very compelling, and it was so compelling that I thought it was worth sharing with you all today. So in this study, we did narrative analysis. We met with families for um, somewhere between 90 minutes and two hours, and we had just six open-ended questions, meaning that we gave a lot of space for families to tell their own stories. Um, we used narrative analysis, which means that we recorded and transcribed verbatim everything that was shared, and then not just did a thematic analysis of the content, but also narrative analysis that includes the process of the ways we as human beings construct our stories to make meaning of them. So this mom had lost custody of eight children. She was a single mom and was most definitely struggling at this point in her life. She started talking about about halfway through the period of her case plan, the court was actually considering uh, moving towards premature termination of parental rights because of how poorly the case was going. In other words, she was not attending her parenting classes. She was not attending her substance abuse treatment program. She was not complying with just about all aspects of the case plan, and she had a court hearing coming up shortly. And so things were about as bad as they possibly could be. Now remember, this is a mom who was eligible for a study about resilience. She actually ultimately did um, accomplish all those goals. Her children, all eight, were returned to her care. That had happened several years before our study took place. And at the point that we were interacting with her, she was serving as an advocate for other parents who were working to achieve reunification in the child welfare system. So if you think about somebody who goes from this moment to this moment, that represents some pretty big deal change, right? So. Here she is in her process talking about things going about as bad as they can be. And then she says something that I think is very striking for all of us as we celebrate Social Work Month and, and celebrate all of you who are being recognized today. She said, things were terrible and this was happening. And here's the quote that came next. She said, and then I got a new caseworker and she, believed in me. She believed in me even before I believed in myself. And then everything changed. For, for this mom who demonstrates an unbelievable example of resilience and, and amount of change that frankly is a little bit hard to even fathom, she attributes that moment of her significant change story to one person, a social worker, and a social worker who believed in her. Now, there's a lot of things that are really um, important in this story that I think are relevant for us today. First off, this mom is talking about this one person changing the trajectory of not just her life, but her eight children who ultimately the legacy of the future of their family is all hindered on this particular pivotal moment. But I don't know if that social worker actually knows that this mom and this family attributes that change to that person. A lot of times in social work, we do hard work. We plant seeds that create a legacy of change and we don't get a thank you. We don't even know actually the outcome of what happened. So first of all, thank you for what you're doing because you may not always hear it, but you are making a difference. The second thing is it's a reminder that one person can indeed make a difference. Think about it for a moment. If you're in the child welfare system and you've got eight kids and you're at the place that she was at this point in her life, can't you imagine that she must have interacted with many um, social service professionals along the way to get there? And yet it was this person that caused her to see something different. So I, I dug in here with her a little bit and asked some more. And she said, what people don't understand is that I myself was abused by several of my family members growing up. And to keep me quiet, to keep me from speaking about the abuse that I was experiencing, I was taught that I was worthless. And so then I grew up and then I partnered with people who just demonstrated the idea that I was worthless. And then I ended up in a system within social services that at times also treated me like I was worthless. So all of these moments just reiterate the thought of what I had constructed as my own identity. But when I then met somebody who said that I mattered, who suggested that my life has worth and who believed that I had the capacity to be a good mom, everything changed. So the first 
thing to remember is things don't always come, but you all should be thanked for the great work that you're doing. The second is that one person can indeed make a difference. But the third is that the how that we engage in these pivotal moments in the lives of vulnerable populations with who we work matters. The how matters. So we be talked way back about not putting an upper limit about what people are capable of. When we believe the potential for people to accomplish great things, guess what, they can. But when we put a top on what somebody's capable of, that's about as high as they can thrive or they can arrive or rise to. Um, so this social worker chose to blow the top off of what was possible for this mom and this family. And this mom decided to accept and receive that challenge and ultimately start what was then a long process. It's not like how it is portrayed in movies and TV. You don't have an aha moment and everything's all better. She then had to engage in a very deep involved change process and ultimately that changed the trajectory of her life and her young people. So as we wrap up and we're reminded that one person can indeed make a difference, I think about what happens when us, this group and the folks interacted, um, connected with the School of Social Work, when we string together many, many and then moments, when we approach our work from a position of hope and belief in the capacity that all, all people can grow and change, one person can change a life together collectively. That is how we change the world. So as I wrap up today, just know I'm unbelievably proud to be associated with this profession, with this school, and so grateful for all who are being recognized today. Thank you, Dean Leitz, for those words to recenter and ground us and, uh, on the work we do and why we do it. Now the director of the School of Social Work, Dr. Elizabeth Lightfoot, will offer a welcome, share some remarks, and important announcements. Liz, this is your first Social Work Month at ASU. How's it going so far? Hi, uh, thanks, Sandra. It's been great so far. Um, there is so much going on at the School of Social Work here for Social Work Month. Um, up till today, we'd already had seven people, 700 people attending our celebrations, and I'm looking down and there's another 126, so over 800 people um, so far have been part of this month-long celebration at ASU. And I also want to thank Dean Leitz for sharing that great story with us, um, with such wonderful lessons for us, especially about the importance of one person in changing someone's life and really in changing the world. So um, that was fabulous. Brought, sort of brought a few tears to my eyes. Um, so greetings, everyone. My name is Liz Lightfoot, and I'm the director of the School of Social Work. And I want to thank everyone for joining us to, to celebrate the important work that our profession does. Um, you know, including our award winners and and everybody really in the entire school who has achieved so much during this challenging year. So to our students, thank you for choosing our school and for choosing social work as a profession. And to our alumni, welcome back. And to our fellow social work um, faculty and staff, thank you for all you do. And no matter where you are in your social work journey, you are always welcome here at ASU. So last year when I joined ASU as a School of Social Work Director, the school was closing out um, our celebration of our 60th year. And what struck me then was not just the accomplishments of our faculty and staff, which are pretty amazing, or the passion of our students, um, which is even maybe more amazing, <laughs> that was reflected in all our anniversary events, but it was also the community's commitment to our school. And even in this time of pandemic and social unrest, which seems to keep going and going, our attention um, that our community partners put um, to us and on our anniversary, to use our anniversary celebration as an opportunity to focus our attention on our workforce's pipeline, which is our students. So this led us to establish a student emergency fund to support basic needs of students who are navigating many financial obstacles that go beyond just their tuition expenses. So we raised thousands from our social work community, which continues to provide one-time assistance for social work students in need today. And as we welcomed a new year, we received a word of another generous gift. An anonymous donor 
social worker, shared a contribution to the ASU Foundation specifically to give a scholarship to every single MSW student in our Yuma program. We are pretty blown away with this. Um, I see this, these as tremendous investments in the future of the profession of social work, and I'm hoping we can build more of these to further strengthen our profession. Um, so I want to thank the community for all your support for the School of Social Work. We hope to keep in touch with you throughout the year to share our latest news and to invite you to our events. And please consider subscribing to our news and events. And I think um, we'll put the chat in uh, or, or the link to the chat on how to sign up for our mailing list so you can learn about all of these events. Um, we're also looking to add to our community advisory board in Phoenix. So this community board supports the connection between the school and our community, particularly among social work practitioners. And the, this community advisory board provides input and advice on our education and training mission. And we are particularly looking for younger alumni, social workers from diverse racial and ethnic backgrounds, and individuals who have expertise in working with older adults, tribal communities, and LGBTQ communities. We also welcome individuals who work with or are closely tied um, to our region's community colleges. So again, welcome to our event and, and happy Social Work Month. I hope to see you at future continuing education events, workshops, conferences, or at our new critical issue series events. Um, so we're moving on now to the, to the part you're all here for, and that's the award presentation. And before we celebrate our newest award winners, we wanna be sure to congratulate and recognize all of those who are nominated for an award. Thanks to all of these colleagues, students, and, and um, partners for their excellent work this year. This, I hear, was the largest set of nominations that the ASU School of Social Work has ever received, and I'm not surprised, and we celebrate you all today. So now um, I have the pleasure of kick kicking off our awards presentation with our first honor, which is the Director's Award for Distinguished Service to the Profession, which is the highest honor awarded by the school. It recognizes a social worker who has a career of achievement in social work practice, research, or advocacy that has a, had a lasting impact on social conditions in the Southwest, shows an inspiring leadership and commitment to innovative thinking and action, acts with a high standard of integrity and actively participates in mentoring the next generation of social workers through teaching, field instruction, or training. And so we are very proud to announce that this year's winner is our own Professor Elizabeth Siegel, professor at the School of Social Work. So Professor Siegel, or Liz as she likes to be known by, I, I like to be known by that too, by the way, um, is a social policy analyst with a background in professional social work. She has served on the faculties of three major universities and spent a, a year as a congressional fellow in Washington, D.C. through the American Association for the Advancement of Science. But for the past 26 years, she has called our school home. The, the focus of her scholarship has been to understand our social welfare system and the impact of public policies and programs on disenfranchised populations, particularly poor families and others who, who suffer from social inequities. Her research also explores the topic of social empathy and how greater empathetic insight can lead to the creation of more effective social welfare policies and programs. Her publications are many, but many of you who have been a social work student likely know her through her two influential textbooks. The first, in Introduction to the, Pro to the Profession of Social Work, is widely used to introduce undergraduate students to professional social work. The second, Social Welfare Policy and Social Programs, is used in both undergraduate and graduate social work degree programs to teach the required competencies of social welfare policy analysts and social welfare policy advocacy. And so we use both of these texts at ASU today. And her most recent book, published just a few years ago, Social Empathy, The Art of Understanding Others, explores how we can develop our ability to understand one another and have compassion toward different groups, something I'm sure we can all agree we need more of. So in addition to being an influential social work scholar, she has been a steadfast colleague, leader, 
and mentor within the School of Social Work, including serving as the interim social, School of Social Work director a few times and briefly as an associate dean. Um, but Liz was instrumental in cr the creation and implementation of our online MSW program, now one of ASU's top five most popular online graduate degree programs. And at a time when student debt has become a serious national concern and demand for social workers is so high, the program's intention, and it always has been, is to offer graduate students in social work an affordable and meaningful education, no matter where in Arizona or in the entire world they are learning. She is a strong student advocate as well and readily mentors students at all levels in all aspects of their academic pursuits. Liz is always ready to provide assistance and leadership both within our school and for our community. In the months that I have been here, I have been so impressed and thankful with just how knowledgeable and generous she is. As a policy expert, she is somewhat of a mastermind on our own school's policies. And she responds to nearly constant requests from all corners to interpret our own policies for us in a gracious manner and always with an eye toward equity and fairness. She is also generous in sharing her knowledge and expertise with the community and provides support for our community social workers as demonstrated by her support of our NASW Arizona chapter by volunteering to provide our social workers with continue, continuing training, education training on social empathy. So as you can tell, and I've probably embarrassed her greatly, Liz is the most deserving of the director's award for her distinguished service to our profession through her scholarly achievements educational leadership, and her lifelong commitment to preparing the next generations of social work scholars, or social workers and social work scholars. So it is my great pleasure to present the 2022 Director's Award to Professor Siegel. And while Liz is very humble, she agreed to share a short talk with us as she is always the educator. So her keynote today will offer us some encouragement and will challenge us as she shares her thoughts on what social work does best, what work we have left to do, and how our profession can build to advance social justice. So as you listen, please feel free to chat in your questions to Professor Siegel, and we will do our best to facilitate a brief Q&A session after her talk. So congratulations, Liz. We're very happy to give you this award. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm honored. Um, and I'm going to try to handle the uh, technology as well. So I'm going to, I guess that worked, didn't it? Um, thank you all. I hope, you, I assume everyone can see the screen. Yes, yes, okay. Th um, thank you so much and thank you for the kind words. Um, I really am rather speechless, which is unusual for me as you all know. But so I'll, I think the best thing to do is to move into what I know best and that's my research. And to share with you a little bit, I really am honored to speak on Social Work Month because I'm honored to be a social worker, which I have been for several decades and have never ever um, thought for a moment that it wasn't, it was the best thing that ever um, happened to me and gave me a career that I have thoroughly loved and appreciate. Um, today, what I want to talk about is in honor of, of, of this month, but also in thinking about what really drew me to the profession is what social work does best. And I'd like to share that with you. From my perspective, there are really three aspects that stand out as what social work does best and what social work um, shares with all of us. And I welcome other people's thinking and ideas. But for me, these are the three items that I sort of, I wanna share and, and center what I'm gonna talk about today. As a profession, we run across all levels. We blend the micro, meso, and macro. We look at individuals all the way through small groups, communities, all the way up to social welfare policy and public policy. And that to me suggests that we have a broad understanding and a broad breadth of understanding of, of humanity. Um, the second thing that is an important aspect that we in social work, I think, 
hold dear is context, is that we really understand and look at the surroundings, both physical and metaphorical and historical of both individuals and society. So context is really important for us. And the third item that I think sets us apart as a profession, possibly more than any other profession, and I have not done an exhaustive search, but I don't know of other professions that put front and center in their work, mm -hmm. that in their commitment, that they have a commitment to social justice. And I think that's an ethical principle that we can all be very proud to be a part of. And so as I was preparing, I, I was just glancing and grabbed that handy book we all have, the Code of Ethics, the NASW Code of Ethics. But in the preamble, just the first paragraph, of this entire code of ethics are those three aspects that I think make us unique and are special. And those three aspects of the blend across micro all the way to macro that we care about context, environment, we often talk about person and environment and that we promote social justice. So even just in the first paragraph, the preamble to our code of ethics, we have all three of these aspects. Um, before I go further and, and share what I'm going to talk about today, I do want to take a moment for a little bit of our, our, our um, understanding that we have a long ways to go still. We, we have work to do. Social work is indeed a work in progress. Um, we haven't always gotten it right. We have a history of sometimes missing the mark. We may have be part of systems and part of history. And so um, it's good to think through this. And as we celebrate ourselves, and I have every intention of speaking highly of what we do best, I do want to take a moment and I want to share with you, this was last summer, NASW put together a, a booklet on um, the systemic racism, pl the places that social work has fallen short. and. I highly recommend that you look at it. I'm just sharing just a handful um, of the items in that report. But I think it's important before we, we move on to, to remember that we have learned as we've gone along and that we have a lot to continue to learn. And I was particularly um, struck by the Settlement House Movement and the charity organization societies. Because when I teach social welfare and I teach the history of social work, it's really important to look at where we came from and we came from Settlement House Movement and we came from the charity organization societies. The charity organization societies with their emphasis on individuals and the Settlement House with their emphasis on groups and communities. And that's a proud background for us, but they didn't always get it right. And they didn't always know how to best work and, and to recognize systems that were oppressive. So I think that this is, this is part of our history. We don't have to hide from it. I think that it doesn't negate that we do other things well, but I wanted to at least recognize that we still, that we have not always hit the mark and that we can continue in a direction of, of learning and building so that we do hit the mark in, as we progress in the future. So what do we do best? Well, one of those things, as I mentioned, was attention to context. And I don't know about the, some of you are students. I think some of you right now are in a human behavior class. Um, when I came to social work, it was human behavior in the social environment. And it was just the name of a class. Sometimes we call it HIPSI. And um, it was something we had to take. But as I took the course, and now, of course, with the perspective of decades of work, it's really something that we consider the context of human beings and how they interact on all levels. And we consider them from, as I said, from the individual all the way up to the larger community and public policy. It's also a hallmark <clears throat> excuse me, of our attention to context that we understand how people are influenced by systems and how the power of these systems can influence people. Um, Dr. Leach gave us an example where a system has such strong impact on an individual and we have cases like that all the time in our work. 
And I think because we look at systems and because we think like that, and we think about human behavior in the social environment, we are empowered and we have the tools and can create the tools to change those systems. So that's where I think we do best in social work. For me, social work's attention to context and these three aspects is at the heart of empathy. And I'm gonna talk about that because I'm integrating my work, which is a wonderful aspect of these opportunities. Um, I, I wanna mention for a moment that I came to the work on empathy, not from what may, many of my colleagues may share from a clinical end, but I actually came to it because I was trying to understand how sometimes public policies do well by people and sometimes how they miss the mark and they can be very, very punitive. And I was trying to figure out in my teaching of public policy, social welfare policy, how to get this across. And it, it led me one way or another to the concept of empathy, which like many of you is a part of what I thought I did as a social worker. And I think I did, but I didn't know a lot about empathy from the psychology perspective because I was really interested in, in the public policy. So I had to start somewhere and that's where I started my study of empathy. And it happened at the same time over the past 10, 15 years that cognitive neuroscientists who have been perfecting the ability to read neural activities and brain work um, started looking at empathy too and discovered all sorts of neural markers. And I'm gonna share a little bit about that. So that's what I'm gonna do. Um, today in terms of my research. And I warn you, it's very brief and it, it's very superficial, but I wanted to share that with you because it's social work that brought me here and is connected to empathy. So overall, when we think of empathy, there's a lot of misuse of it. You hear it on television and by politicians. And basically it is a very complicated physiological and cognitive learned process. I look at empathy from a full umbrella of empathy to include interpersonal empathy. And that's our ability to share or understand what others are, the typical how we think of empathy and social empathy, which is broader and helps us to bring empathy into the policy arena. I'm not gonna go through all of it, but based on the cognitive neuro neuroscience and thanks to all of their brain mapping and my, trying to master it, and I'm not a cognitive neuroscientist, I assure you, I'm not even close. But basically, there are a number of ask components, pieces that we engage in and abilities, some are unconscious, and some are cognitively learned and therefore can be conscious. And we bring these all together, and when they all hit in a strong way, then we have a very strong empathic ability. Um, not every day are we all good at all of these, but when we understand the parts, we can build them and train them. And I'd love to have the time to go through in depth, but um, this just consider this an overview and I hope you'll want to pursue it more. But these are the seven components that seem to be reflected in the cognitive neuroscience and that build empathy. Just to give you a quick view of how complicated empathy is, to us, when we're engaged in it, it feels simultaneous. And all those, any number of those seven components feel like they're just happening. And they are because the brain operates in nanoseconds. But actually, cognitive neuroscience has identified, and this is probably the minimum, but they've already identified nine different parts of the brain that light up when people are engaged in empathic thinking or feeling or behaviors. So just to share with you this incredibly complex, even though people use empathy, like it's just a simple, oh, I get you. Um, it's a really complicated neurological experience and involves so much of our brain. For me, the combination of building what we call interpersonal empathy, these are the five components that I first listed with other components build social empathy. And that's empathy on a, on a macro level. And I, I want to point out that often people think empathy is the outcome, like, oh, I'm empathic or that's an empathic person. They're doing great things. 
actually empathy is not the doing. Empathy is the experience that you are taking in this understanding. Whether you do something with it or not is a next step. Now there's lots of really compelling, excellent research that shows that when people engage empathically, when they, and neurologically we can see that, they are typically, not always, but typically moved to do good, pro-social behavior is what it's called. And so when we understand the macro empathic, we are typically, but not always, we are typically moved to consider large scale doing good and that's social justice. So for me, social work is the pathway to what I've been doing with social empathy. Briefly, it's not easy and there's lots of barriers. One of the strongest barriers to empathy that I think is something we all as social workers come across and that is that it's really difficult for people to be empathic to those who are not like them. Or said the other way, it's easier to be empathic for people who are like you. We call this the in-group, out-group bias. And of course, we know this because we've studied systemic oppression, systemic racism, institutionalized forms, as well as personal prejudice. And so we know that empathy can be difficult to cultivate especially when people aren't exposed to differences. And in fact, and this is one um, neural study I'm just sharing, but there's a lot of neural evidence of this empathy gap and that we literally don't respond in the same way to people who are different than us. And in fact, and there's great research that shows when people are tested before they're looked at for empathy, when they're tested on prejudice, those who had stronger prejudices we're actually even less likely to be empathic. So we know these are ways that block empathy and that's a challenge and it's a challenge to us in social work. It's a challenge to us in humanity. So if we can bridge the social, this empathy gap, if we can connect people to empathy, there's a lot of positives. Um, I, I'm speaking to people who probably know that, but it's worth, highlighting how strong, and that's why I, I've been so interested in the study of empathy, that empathy is actually um, a way to improve social relationships. It improves um, or decreases prejudice and stereotyping. It's also um, improves social responsibility. And that's the social justice piece, I think that's so important. And so if we improve empathy and we can bridge that gap, we've got more positive relationships, we've got decreasing of prejudice and stereotyping, and it also um, creates a morality, a, a level of morality. And that was Hoffman, um, who's Martin Hoffman, who's a psychologist, who spent decades studying the morality behind empathy and how children who learn empathy also learn how to be um, a good citizen, a good person and, and learn morality. We can connect people. And then very recently, Terry Gibbons, who's actually a political scientist um, and wrote from more of a personal perspective, but she talks about something called radical empathy, which I would I, I agree with as social empathy, but that if we embrace empathy on this broader scale, then we're more likely to take on the action of changing communities. So there's a lot of good to be, said for bridging that gap. So how do we do that? And again, I'm, I'm doing a brief overview. So um, empathy, I think is a lifelong, not even think, I believe and know that it's a lifelong endeavor. We have the components, the hard, we're hardwired um, for the most part to learn to be empathic, but we need to learn it. So how do we do that? And I have a model that really um, is from the broader to the narrow and the first way that we start building empathy is to expose people and expose ourselves more broadly to new experiences, different people, to gain that exposure. That's a good start, but that's not enough. We have to learn about what we're exposed to. We have to study and understand those events, the history, the culture, what has contributed to people's differences and how that explains those differences. And then the third level, which is the most sort of labor intensive, so to speak, is to actually 
experience. We know that empathy is built on a mirroring and is built on an ability to vicariously feel what others do as if we are feeling it ourselves. And so by actually doing it, we enhance that. That's how we build those neural pathways. That's how we build empathy. So this model is what I, is progressively built to enhance empathy. And here's the best part for me, and by doing this presentation, I realized why I was so drawn to empathy, is because social work does that. We do that as a profession because that's part of us. Um, particularly here in a school of social work, we create an educational model and we share that across the nation because we're all accredited by the same a um, social work body, the Council on Social Work Education, we expose people to new ideas, new experiences, and then we train them to, to analyze, to understand what do those mean? What do those new ideas and experiences mean? And we bring in history, we bring in context. We teach our students what these mean and how to do this over a deeper understanding. So it's not just exposure, its explanation, and then even more than that is the experience. You cannot get a social work degree without doing hands-on, three-dimensional <laughs> work with people. If you look at even just the credits that we offer through our social work degree, half of those credits in the master's program are doing field education. It is the hallmark of what we do, and it is one of the best ways to teach empathy, to walk through, to be a part of it. And we do all of that. So what is it that social work? So just to sort of bring it all together, because for me, what social work does best is what brought me to the study of empathy. It's that we focus across all these systems that we consider the levels from the smallest one individual to public policies that impact millions. And we do that with great attention to context, more than I think other professions are interested in. And we do it with context in the true physical sense, as well as the historical sense, and as well as the more metaphysical, that what people experience in their surroundings and how that impacts them. And then that last piece is we bring this all together because we have as a mission, a commitment to social justice. I ran through all this. Um, if you're more interested in the details and the technical aspects of empathy, the book, um, I had a wonderful team working with me. And I'm proud to say that all the team members were here at Arizona State University School of Social Work. Um, Professor Emeritus Karen Gertis, and you had the, we've all had the, the, the wonderful honor of having Dean Leitz who is also part of this work with me, and um, Alex Wagaman and Jennifer Geiger, who were, who were members, graduated from our doctoral program and are now um, faculty in their own right. So if you're interested in the details and the more science, and then um, Director Lightfoot mentioned, and I appreciate that, the other book about empathy that is more about social, is all about social empathy. Um, and so if I tried to brush over all of this and um, show you, and I thank you all for this opportunity because it helped me to realize how interwoven my social work experience and my social work education has been to lead me in this study and go someplace I didn't know I was going to go. So thank you very much and I appreciate having this opportunity. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, uh, Professor Siegel. Your perspective helps us all reflect on what makes this the time right for social work and resituates us in, in what we should be doing and how we should be doing it. And I particularly, as you know, we've had lots of conversations about this, um, appreciate the, at the beginning that contextualization that we have some things that where we didn't always get it right and we're continuing to learn and grow through that. So we have time for maybe one or two questions. If you have a question for <laughs> Professor Siegel on uh, anything we've talked about, if you go ahead and drop, drop that question in the chat and uh, this is your time uh, to, to ask Professor Siegel, uh, <laughs> I don't wanna say anything, but 
anything. Sure. <laughs> uh, any questions? Great question, ah. Dr. Anthony. Can one be too empathetic? Yes, <laughs> sort of. Empathic, sorry. Well, actually, so this is a great question. Thank you, Dr. Anthony. One of the key aspects of empathy is emotion regulation, that if we're really engaged well empathically, then we're also engaged in regulating our emotions. So there's been a lot written on the dark side of empathy and how empathy is, is it makes us not be realistic and all these bad things about empathy. Empathy doesn't do that. People do that. Empathy is a tool. And if one engages, so when I discover myself feeling like I'm being over empathetic or I'm too engaged, it's not empathy. It's that I've, uh, it's boundaries. It's remembering that I am not the owner of those emotions, someone else is. And that indeed I need to work on my emotion regulation. And that is what helps be, us be better with empathy. And in fact, if I may, one of the research we did several years ago, looking at seasoned social workers, field liaison, field supervisors through our school, those who had high levels of empathy and had high levels of emotion regulation also stayed in the job longer and, did, and, and scored lower on burnout scales. So actually, it's not too much empathy that burns us out. It's not enough emotion regulation. Great question. Thank you. That's very, very helpful to think about how that overlaps with like our concept of self care and what goes into to that. Absolutely. Okay. I'm not seeing any question, other questions coming through. So I just want to think. Can I just say that someone mentioned the book Against Empathy? And um, Julian is absolutely right. It, it, he got a lot of press the psychologist from Yale who got to write it, who wrote it. But it was, it was, reading it was very depressing to me because he wasn't talking about empathy. He was talking about emotion contagion and not having emotional regulation. And we social workers, we know about that. We learn about boundaries and transference and counter transference and self-care. And, and Chandra, you're absolutely right. So empathy can be a tool for self-care if it's done fully in all of its aspects. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you again. And if we could all give um, Professor Siegel a virtual round of applause. Uh, we should have had our uh, applause track here and we could be playing that right now, but just pretend you're hearing us giving you a, a standing ovation. Thank you again for joining us to celebrate Social Work Month and congratulations on your well-deserved award today. Thank you. Thank you all so much. I appreciate it. Now it is time to recognize the essential social workers whose achievements in practice, education, and service over the past 12 months that we are going to celebrate today. All of them are with us today, and we have, we, and some have chosen to make some brief remarks. We have eight categories worth of outstanding social workers. So to help me present this year's Social Work Month honors, I'm pleased to have two outstanding social workers. Josefina Amada was a member of our Tucson Social Work faculty for 20 years before retiring in 2019. She has not slowed down since that time. However, continuing her uh, community activism and leadership in Tucson and continuing to mentor social work student interns. And we are glad to have her join us back today to help uh, share the awardees. We also are joined today by Cassandra Pena, a 2020 MSW graduate who now works at Molina Healthcare. She also is a community advisory board member here in Phoenix. Just a quick reminder to awardees, you have about 30 seconds to unmute and share a few words. So when they're telling um, all of us about all of the amazingness of you, be prepared to unmute so you're ready to go. Happy Social Work Month to both of you. Cassandra, can you get us started with our next set of awards? Thanks, Dr. Crudup. On behalf of the Community Advisory Board, I send greetings and a warm welcome to our entire social work community joining us today. We also extend our congratulations to Elizabeth Siegel, 
for her achievement as this year's Director's Award winner. The Community Impact Award recognizes outstanding individuals or organizations that exemplify social work values and principles, provide services of impact to community, and that support our profession through the training and employment of social workers. This year's winners were nominated based in part on the strength and ingenuity they showed in responding to urgent social problems and their approach to community engagement and education. Our first community impact honoree is the Debbie Nez Manuel, the granddaughter of a Navajo code talker. Debbie is a longtime community leader and activist with extensive experience and expertise in mobilizing citizens into deep and meaningful community engagement. Ms. Nez Manuel grew up on the Navajo Nation in Northern Arizona and has lived in Phoenix metro area for three decades. Debbie has a comprehensive understanding of the complexities surrounding the victimization of Native American women and girls and was instrumental to the unanimous passage in the Arizona State Senate and House of House Bill 2570. Monumental legislation establishing a 21 member study committee on missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. Her nomination reads in part, Debbie embodies the very qualities that this award is meant to recognize. She fosters learning and social engagement. She is goal-oriented, organized, and she communicates clearly and effectively. She listens patiently and respectful of others' viewpoints. And she, can, she thinks creatively and develops and implements ideas that are realistic and viable. Her magnetic personality naturally brings people together. Ms. Nez Manuel exudes a strong sense of hope and creativity. Please join me in honoring Debbie Nez Manuel for her community impact. Congratulations, Debbie. Would you like to say a few words? Sure, thank you so much, everyone. Yate, it's really great to be here with you all. Uh, I think while most might say it's an honor to receive this award, I think in social work, that's a little bit more, uh, it, it just doesn't connect with me. But what I'd rather say is that I'm up for the challenge. I accept the challenge. Uh, my work developed over a period of time. It started in crisis intervention, clinical counseling among individuals and groups, and then moved into community education and health and then prevention with women and girls when it came to their safety. Uh, more recently, I started doing the policy work and decided to risk it all in the political arena. Yay, social workers in, the, in politics. Um, but there's one thing I haven't done. Um, some of my professors would, would uh, have said a time or two that you truly haven't accomplished your goals if you have not ended up in jail for something that you truly believed in. And so I hope that no one here in this group has to ever go to see a Bell's bondman, but um, I'm really proud of the work that I've done with all of my colleagues here in Arizona and really appreciate the uh, teachings and the principles that come from my family. Thank you so much for the award, everyone. Thank you, Debbie, for those remarks. Um, I'm having some difficulties. My computer froze, so I can't see my notes. Can someone um, move forward? Absolutely. Our next Community Impact Awardee is the Family Involvement Center. The Family Involvement Center assists and supports families of children with emotional, behavioral, and mental health needs. More than half of its board of directors are parents with lived experience navigating child-serving systems. Almost Also, most FIC staff members have direct experience parenting children who needed the services of multiple social and public service agencies. The nomination specifically lauds Family Involvement Center for its work developing a program to assist other parents with addiction to navigate the child welfare system and recovery. 
The Parent Peer Support Social Work Scholarship Stipend Program created as part of a four-year grant from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Health Resources and Services Administration, is designed specifically to develop careers for individuals based on their life experiences so they may help others dealing with similar circumstances. The program provides participants a year of live online social work courses at Mesa Community College, a computer to access classes, and a monthly stipend to cover the cost of internet services and other living experience expenses. Accepting the award on behalf of FIC is Karen Klein, a 1990 graduate of our MSW program. At the Family Involvement Center, Karen is responsible for creating and developing programs, providing services to children and adults who have de a Department of Child Safety involvement. As a frontline worker for many years, Karen understands that working with people who have suffered from trauma calls for a different approach in how we um, understand behavior. Thank you, Karen, and the Family Involvement Center for being a voice for Arizona families dealing with emotional, physical and behavioral challenges. Um, Josefina, would you like to present the next award? Yes, thank you, uh, Chandra. I'm honored to be here this afternoon to present our next award category. Our next community impact honoree is one I know very well, Casa Alitas. Casa Alitas is part of Catholic Community Services of Southern Arizona and serves migrant families who are escaping uh, violence and poverty in their home country. The program offers hospitality, humanitarian aid, medical services, short-term shelter, and helps migrants reunite with family members in the US. The agency is committed to serving the most vulnerable population with intentionality and holistic care while advocating for better immigration policy and systems. In addition to the tremendous impact of their work with migrants in Southern Arizona, Casa Alitas is committed to social service education. For example, in collaboration with faculty from the University of Arizona Health Sciences and ASU School of Social Work, they developed the migration into professional leading to action and growth, uh, fondly known as Milagro Training Program. Nine ASU Tucson social work students have participated in the Milagro program over the past two years. It is with deep gratitude that I present this Community Impact Award to the entire Casa Alitas team. Accepting the award this afternoon on behalf of Casa Alitas is Diego Lopez, a 2018 graduate of our MSW program. Congratulations. And thank you for all that you've done for our migrant families. Diego, would you like to say some brief remarks? Thank you, Josefina. And I'll start by saying um, I was not ready for you to present this award. And it's so heartwarming to have one of my many mentors from ASU uh, presenting this award to me as a social work graduate. So uh, thank you for the impact that the School of uh, Social Work has had in my life a greater, more the community impact that Elites has had for over uh, the 30 some thousand people that have come through the shelter going across the United States started truly by a grassroots response from our Tucson community. But uh, as we were been uprooted, I hope you see what I did there, to many different locations and meeting different needs, it's been really beautiful to see that the impact of costly has been far more the impact of our community and the collection of great people like those that are here in this uh, Convening. So thank you all so much uh, from Casalitas and myself, bottom of our hearts. Thank you. One reason I love all of these awards is because I get to hear about all the great things happening around Arizona. We don't always, we stay in our lane sometimes and we don't always hear outside of our bubble and it's wonderful to hear about the great work that's being done. Our next three awards recognize our future social workers, our students in training. Our first honoree is Eva Pena, outstanding intern for 2022. Eva is an MSW student in our Tucson program and part of our child welfare education program. She recently completed her internship at LPKNC, a small nonprofit that focuses on prevention of substance abuse and misuse 
promotes mental health and suicide prevention for youth and families. Her nomination reads in part, Eva has stepped up and helped in so many ways, including conducting a needs assessment about the South Side community of Tucson. This information was helpful in completing a task needed for a grant through ACCESS. In addition to the needs assessment, Eva took on writing a small grant for a group called Gen Z Community Champions, a young adult group supported by LPKNC. Eva worked with this group of young adults um, to write a grant to help educate people of color in their age group about the importance of voting. We celebrate Eva's impact and hard work with this award. Congratulations. Our second awardee is Morgan McLaughlin Kessel, also an outstanding intern. Morgan is an online MS student, MSW student in California who completed her internship in 2021 at the Alternate Public Defender Office of San Diego County. Her nomination reads, Morgan exemplifies the qualities of a professional social worker. She took advantage of every learning opportunity to increase her knowledge and skills in the area of forensic mental health, including enrolling in the ASU online certificate program in criminal sentencing and sentencing advocacy. She regularly shared her new knowledge with other interns and investigates staff at her placement investigative staff at her placement. For example, she shared peer-reviewed journal articles relevant to serving clients with psychiatric and intellectual disability needs. She also used social work research to determine evidence-based practice in working with a population that experienced various trauma as juveniles and adults, and then shared this with staff at her placement. I can't, I can think of no intern more deserving of such a recognition. Congratulations, Morgan. Would you like to say something? Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Um, this year's theme, the time is right for social work. I wholeheartedly agree. Our local neighborhoods, regional communities, and our nation as a whole have endured incredible circumstances in the last few years. And these hardships have revealed the inequality that's impacting all of us bias, injustice, and corruption in our economic, carceral, and social systems. I'm honored to be selected as an outstanding intern. My intern training as a mitigation investigator at a public defender's office has truly been soul-filling work, and I could not have done it without Judy Kreisick, who was willing to be my field supervisor. So thank you so much. All right, and I'm gonna turn it over to Josefina. And, and remind her to uh, unmute. Oh, congratulations, Morgan. Our next two honorees were chosen by peers at their respective campuses as emerging leaders. The Emerging Leader Award recognizes a future practitioner of promise whose leadership inside and outside the classroom sets an example for, for peers. Our first honoree is Emily Wall a BSW student at our Tucson campus. Emily followed her passion in child welfare after personal experience with the system. Emily works at the Children's Advocacy Center in Tucson and aspires to be an LCSW to help children and youth that have experienced trauma, but also prevent such traumas. Her nomination reads, quote, she has been a great representation of what a social worker is and should be. She upholds the ethical standards of a social worker as well as demonstrating great leadership in the classroom. She was helpful, encouraging, and kind. And I just know that she will make a difference in this field after graduating. She helped me a great deal with her leadership and kindness in a quote. Emily, you are awesome. D did you, would you like to say something? I just want to thank you. Um, I'm pleased with the nomination. I, I'm just so happy to be nominated in general. Um, I want to congratulate everyone else that's um, being awarded today. Thank you, Emily. Our second honoree is Katonia Begay, an MSW student at our downtown campus. Katonia identifies as Danae, 
woman from a rural community on the Navajo Nation, but now resides on ancestral homelands of the Akamil, Otham, and Peeposh. Her current work involves interning with the ASU School of Social Work Office of American Indian Projects, a lab member with the research on violent victimization in the School of Criminology and Criminal Justice and Community Coordinator for the American Indian Social Work Student Association. Her nomination reads, Katonia stands out amongst our peers. She demonstrates confidence and passion when discussing her internship in class. Katonia makes every class better by her being in it. Her contributions are insightful and intelligent. Her class presentations demonstrate a high level of knowledge, empathy, competence, and professionalism. It is very clear to me that Katonia will be a leader in our field and I look forward to seeing her impact on the world. We agree with the nominator. Congratulations, Katonia. You are also welcome to say a few words. Yat Eshik Asha Dosha Dana Ash A Katani Vige Yanishia, Adona and Shlinigi A Twitchi Nishli, Twitsoni Bushes Chin, Ozea Shiha Dasha Che, and Sinajini Dashanala, Akut Awe San Nishlin. Um, I just wanted to thank you all for um being here today and most of all thank you to my support system which includes my family my friends my loved ones um also huge thank you to the office of american indian projects um the rovb lab and also the office of american indian initiatives most of all thank you to my instructors and my peers um you truly <laughs> have um, opened my eyes to social work and i'm just very thankful to be amongst all of you so thank you Our next three awards recognize achievements among graduates of the School of Social Work. Our first award recognizes Laura Meyer for early career achievements. Lawyer, Laura, Laura, did I lose somebody? Sorry, I'm having difficulty still. Nope, you're good, Laura. Mm -hmm. Okay, Laura earned her MSW in 2020 in our Tucson program. Soon after graduating, she became a founding program manager at the ASU COVID-19 case investigation and community response program, supporting the Maricopa County Department of Public Health. In this role, Laura has been responsible for spearheading the design, development and implementation of virtual training and supervision unit that involves 20 paid staff and more than 200 volunteers. Under her supervision, the team has investigated and closed more than 80,000 positive cases in Maricopa. Wow. Her nomination reads, Laura has demonstrated remarkable leadership in this role, including her ability to work under pressure, handle multiple and competing demands, and deal with its project scope as we manage a full situation given the contours of the pandemic. President Crow recognized the work of this COVID-19 community response unit with the awarding of President's Award for Social Embeddedness. Congratulations on all your success, Laura. You are welcome to say a few words. Thank you so much. And I, um, I feel so grateful to be a graduate of the Tucson MSW PAC program. I felt it really prepared me for what I have been doing the past couple of years. And I have so many mentors from this program and from ASU, and it's so many of you are on this call right now, and there's too many of you to name, um, but especially to uh, Dr. Michael Schaefer for just encouraging me every uh, step of the way. And of course, uh, to uh, my mentors at the ASU COVID-19 case investigation team. And lastly, uh, to my dear family, including my grandmother, Jeanette, who is 93 and who is on this Zoom call. Um, so thank you so much, everybody. Could not have done it without this program behind me. Thank you, Laura. Our Professional Achievement Award recognizes social workers who graduated from ASU five or more years ago. We have two winners this year. First up is Judy Engel. Judy graduated from ASU with her MSW in 1991. Since then, her career and clinical trainings has spanned hospice care, school social work, and substance abuse treatment support and recovery. After a powerful experience with substance use disorder within her family, she was motivated to return to school, earning a PhD in psychology with a research focus on family support, 
theoretical models that can help individuals with addiction. Her nomination reads, Dr. Engel has positively impacted hundreds of students and their families as a school social worker and educator. She has been a competent clinician in using evidence-based practices from the field of social work to improve the welfare and mental health of students. She has also been a strong advocate for social justice and the achievement of all students. Today, we seek out Dr. Engel to offer her knowledge, experience, and expertise to help families of students living with a possible drug abuse problem. She is a wonderful resource and advocate for these students and families within the community. Congratulations on this achievement, Judy. Please say a few words. Thank you. I would first like to thank ASU for your integrity, your research, and what I learned in the School of Social Work has stayed with me all my life, allowed me to be a better person and to help others. But what I wanna encourage ASU to do is my doctoral research was in Tempe in a parent program for parents of young adults living with a substance use disorder. I encourage you to reach out to me or look at my research as this program is in your backyard. It changed my life as a mother of a young adult with a substance disorder and it changes parents' lives daily. And thank you, ASU, for all you do in the community. Thank you, Judy. Our next Professional Achievement Award goes to Crystal Narcho. Crystal is a 2015 MSW graduate from the School of Social Work Tucson campus. She has continued to exemplify dedication and commitment to the field of social work as a macro practitioner with a focus on prevention programs for young people. She currently serves as the Family Support Coordinator with the Children's Advocacy Center in Tucson and oversees family support services, including the Safe Sleep Prevention Program, Parent Management Training, and the Voices Council, a youth program aimed to improve the quality of services at the center. Crystal also serves as a field instructor with the ASU School of Social Work Tucson campus, mentoring and supporting BSW and MSW students. Her nomination reads in part, Crystal demonstrates the knowledge, skill, and expertise as macro social worker within the organization and community at large. She takes the time to work side by side with her staff, colleagues, and interns, all while demonstrating the right balance of autonomy and guidance. Her passion to support the lives and healing of children, youth, and families who have experienced sexual abuse and assault is clearly defined by her compassion, empathy, and work ethic. Congrat Congratulations, Crystal. Our next set of awards recognize exemplary mentorship of students preparing for practice through our signature pedagogy field education. This afternoon, we recognize five field instructors of the year from across our state. First is Lori Bagano. Lori has been a school social worker at Corona del Sol for eight years and previously served as president of the School Social Workers Association of Arizona. In addition to performing her job as an at an expert level, Lori demonstrates an extraordinary commitment to her school community. Ms. Pagano's experience at multiple levels within the school systems informs her versatile approach to mentorship. Ms. Pagano epitomizes leading by example and aspires others to take ownership of their abilities as change makers. The student who nominated Lori said, quote, Ms. Pagano has empowered me as a student to find my own path as a social worker while being a reassuring guiding force of expertise along the way. Every student would be fortunate to have such a full education experience as I have had with Ms. Pagano in a quote. Congratulations, Lori. Would you like to say a few words? Of course, thank you. Happy Social Work Month, everybody. It's an absolute honor to accept this award and be a part of shaping and guiding new social workers as a field educator. I absolutely love this work. 
I, I also want to thank my family and my partner who are present on the call today for all of your support. I couldn't have done it without you. Thank you, everyone. Next is Cricket Witherington. Cricket is the project manager of Action, Nexus, and Homelessness, where, among other duties, she supports eight interns at the Human Services Campus in downtown Phoenix. Prior to joining us in 2020, Cricket was the director of Community Impact at the Valley of the Sun United Way, and before that, executive director at Hope Village, Arizona, and Gilbert Community Action Network. Her nomination from a student reads in part, quote, anytime there is a need, Cricket goes above and beyond to ensure those needs are met. Her passion to help all humans is incredibly inspiring, and I'm so grateful to have her in my corner. Through her knowledge and guidance, she helped me find what concentration I wanted to pursue and helped me start finding my leadership style and my voice and continues to invest in my growth and development, despite not being my field instructor anymore. I would not be the social worker I am now as she taught me a substantial amount of macro and systems level social work. In a quote, we congratulate Cricket on this awesome achievement. Next is Judy Kirsett. Dr. Kirsett is an Associate Professor and Associate Director for Academic Affairs in the School of Social Work at Arizona State University. She's also the founding director of the ASU Center for Child Wellbeing. In 2021, Dr. Kirsett met a student who found her dream internship, but could not find a social worker to serve as a field instructor. So Judy jumped in. Her nomination reads in part, quote, if it had not been for Judy, I would not have been able to complete my field education. She supported me through a personal emergency with kindness and acceptance. She advised and counseled me when my initial placement was failing to meet my educational needs. And she assisted me when I found a new placement. Judy was able to push me to critically think about social work service in the context of my practice area. Not only did she faithfully supervise with the skills of a compassionate leader, but she also made me feel respected like a colleague, in a quote. Congratulations, Dr. Kirsik, and please feel free to say a few words. Thank you, Josefina, and I wanna congratulate all of the awardees, and I want to acknowledge the field office for the amazing role that they play in our school. They make managing over a thousand students in field education look easy, and we know that that's no easy task. It's an amazing privilege to work with our students at the School of Social Work, and they give us hope, as we can see in the current students that we're honoring today, as well as our recent graduates and our longer-term alumni, so thank you. Congratulations, Judy. Next, we honor a colleague of mine, Carla Montijo. Carla earned her BSW and MSW at our school and is now working as a field unit supervisor with ASU's Child Welfare Education Program. Her nomination mentions her dedication to students, to her staff and team at the Department of Child Safety, to the profession of child welfare, social work, and to vulnerable children and families. Carla is consistently rated by her students as being highly effective, helpful, available, and supportive. She goes above and beyond in planning for students' learning, preparing training and activities for students, debriefing with students, providing one-on-one -on -one and group supervision, and coaching and mentoring them. A student shared, quote, she was a wonderful leader and a great example of how to professionally compassionately and effectively be a social worker, in a quote. Congratulations, Carla, and thank you for your service. And our final field education award goes to my dear friend and colleague, Efarin Carrillo, 
who I've known for over 30 years. He works at Pueblo High School in Tucson. He is a native of Chihuahua, Mexico, but raised in Central California, where he marched with Cesar Chavez and the United Farm Workers in the 1970s. He earned his MSW in 1978 from San Jose State. His nomination mentions that he is a, quote, enthusiastic fuel instructor, supervising up to four interns a year for the past 15 years. As a seasoned professional, he has been an outstanding role model for ASU students, introducing them to school-based programs such as bilingual support groups, exceptional education, counseling, and a multitude of other support groups. He established a partnership between the school's district and Big Brothers Sisters to allow school personnel to be mentors to our young students. This program called Amigos was the first of its kind nationwide. Congratulations, mi amigo Efrain. Would you like to say a few words? Unmute yourself, uh, Efren. I want to thank the ASU School of Social Work for this special recognition. Uh, it's kind of incredible recognition. Uh, there's so many things that are going through my mind right now. I do have to uh, single out Jose Martinez, my counselor at community college who steered uh, me into this career. And uh, I know I couldn't be here talking to you all if it wasn't for the 20 plus mentors that have graced the halls of Pueblo High School. I do want to leave you with uh, a touching email that was sent to me by a former student. Uh, he basically reached out to me saying uh, how much I, I meant to him, but his last comments was, thank you for making me feel like I wasn't wasting your time. And so uh, with that, I'll leave you. Uh, and the model that I like to use is listen to engage. Thank you very much. Congratulations. And we have more awardees, just a handful more. It's so exciting. I'm, I'm seeing in the chat all of the congratulations and, and um, just in awe of the, the impact that we as social workers are having across the state because of, our, of the work you all are doing. So next, we honor social work educators for their excellence in classroom instruction as nominated and selected by students at each campus. Each instructor of the year has brought innovation to their teaching methods in the classroom and mentorship efforts outside the classroom to advance training in social work knowledge, skills, and values. And they all share a common passion for advocating for the unique educational needs of students. Our first honoree is Kathleen Leonard who was nominated by multiple students at West Campus. Her nomination reads in part, Kathleen has been a fantastic professor during a very difficult semester. She is flexible and understanding in a way that a lot of professors are not. She altered her course schedule and curriculum to make room for myself and my classmates to have a place to talk about and learn about what we wanted and needed to. She is an experienced social worker in many fields and has a wealth of knowledge that I am so grateful to lean on. Another student shared, Kathleen has been nothing but patient with her students, always cautious of the other things occurring in students' lives. She radiates empathy and is always seeking to improve the experiences of those around her. Congratulations to you, Professor Leonard. Our next Honoree. Oh, Kathleen, did you want to say something? Uh, sure, thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, I want to thank um, everyone at the School of Social Work, not only for training me to be a social worker, but also allowing me to train the next generation of social workers. I also want to thank the students for um, this nomination. I love working with students. They are amazing, and I know that they will bring to our profession, a great deal of energy and enthusiasm in the future. I also want to just thank my colleagues and friends who have family who have supported me. I love being a social worker. Thank you. 
Thank you, Kathleen, and congratulations. Our next honoree is Justine Chung, who teaches in our online program. In addition to being an educator, Justine is both a practitioner and researcher with a passion for supporting young people with foster care histories to succeed in post-secondary education. Her nomination notes her compassion and drive to help students succeed in the classroom and her work outside the classroom at ASU. One student remarked, Professor Chung, has not just been influential in my own success, but also in helping others through mentoring. Being a good example herself, she shows us that anything is possible to achieve if you keep moving forward. Congratulations, Justine. Would you like to say a few words? Sure. Um, first of all, nobody is more surprised than me that I got this nomination in one. Um, I, always embraced the identity of being a researcher, but anybody who knows me well, I used to push back on the idea of being a teacher until I was persuaded to put my toe in because I was asked to teach research. So I thought, great combination. Um, I loved teaching in person, but I really worried about transitioning to an online teaching situation. And as anybody who has taught online knows, it, it takes a lot of intentional effort to make connection with students um, above and beyond. I have a full-time job, but I choose to teach in addition to the full-time job. And my students brighten my day um, every time, whether it's online or in person. So first I wanna thank the students um, for just nominating me for this. And then the second thank you actually goes out to so many people that are in this room today. I actually, as a person of a certain age, went back to school much later in life. And so many of my instructors are actually in the room and I want to thank them. Gosh, I thought I'd get through this without getting emotional. Thank them for being such great examples of what it meant to be a good teacher and to be passionate about what they do. And it, I hope I have honored them in my teaching with the gift they gave to me as instructors themselves. Congratulations, Justine. And you were a TA for me way back when too. And so I, I started to see what could be. <laughs> next we have Michelle, Michelle Rascon Conales. She's our next honoree. She teaches at our Tucson campus. Michelle practiced social work for seven years with undocumented children and survivors of human trafficking before returning to school to pursue her PhD, which she hopes to finish in 2023. She was nominated by her students for going above and beyond in and outside the classroom. Her nomination reads in part, she answers emails punctually, stays after class to answer any questions and always will always admit fault when it is time to do so. It is hard finding a professor who will adjust the curriculum to benefit her students. Michelle was always asking us about our other classes because she was interested in us. During my two years of college, I have not met anyone who cared about us as, as a class and as individuals. Well done, Professor Rascon Conales. All right, and I'm now finally we have um, Melissa Megan Mitcher, who was selected by our downtown um, Phoenix students. She is a sought after instructor and students follow her from semester to semester to take her classes. A student favorite, Megan was last year's winner um, in this category as well. So we have a repeat and I love that. Her nomination reads, she is the best instructor I've ever had. She is deeply empathetic and very committed to social justice. She is also a very engaging instructor. I always look forward to her class. Her style of teaching is engaging and innovative. She clearly cares deeply about her students and clients. She was very supportive of me when I was really struggling. And I would also like to say she is a great colleague as well and collaborator and supporter of other instructors. Um, so uh, thank you so much, Megan, for your support of our students and congratulations um, again this year. And now I'm going to turn it over to Cassandra for our last few awards. 
Our final award is named in honor of Laura Orr, who began her career with the so School of Social Work on May 10th, 1971, retiring in 2018 after 47 years of dedicated service. It recognizes staff who have made contributions to improving organizational effectiveness and organizational culture with, while advancing the mission of the School of Social Work. We are pleased to announce three outstanding staff honorees for our 2021 Laura Orr Service Awards. First is Cynthia Peters, a Phoenix native. Cynthia is the field education manager at the School of Social Work. Prior to joining the school, she worked in the Parks and Recreation and Human Service Departments for the City of Phoenix, including supervising student interns for 25 years. Her nomination mentions her outstanding service in providing field education to continuously growing number of social work students while still building and supporting a team culture among staff in the field office. Cynthia also contributes to the profession on national level participating in annual social work conferences and serving on national committees in our profession. She is always available to consult or help out. She's a valued professor, enjoys teaching, and is an exemplary social worker. Congrats, Cynthia. And would you like to share some words? Just a couple. Thank you so much for the award. Uh, after Laura Orr, who spent so much time providing service to, to our School of Social Work, so it's, it's an honor. I also want to thank the field team. Without the team, we couldn't do what we, what we do, and they are an integral part and are, are a part of this award. So thank you again. Congratulations again. Next, we recognize Valerie Sanchez. For the past three years, Valerie has served as the Community Outreach Manager in the ASU Office of Community Health, Engagement and Resiliency, promoting culturally responsive solutions in partnership with community. Valerie's leadership, creativity, and dedication has been instrumental in the office's ability to pivot during the pandemic and provide meaningful opportunities and support to community partners that have been most at risk for detrimental impacts for COVID-19. With the help of her leadership, the office launched a new program called Tucson Community Access, Referral and Educational Services, or CARES, at the Tucson House, the largest public housing community that is home to nearly 500 seniors and persons with disabilities. Congrats on this honor and thank you for all you do for the Tucson community. Our final awardee is Ivan Valerie, Silver. I'm gonna stop real quick and see, did Valerie, did you wanna say something? Um, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll just, uh, I'd just like to take the opportunity to thank, um, thank uh, the School of Social Work and uh, Dr. Mary Ellen Brown, who is the Director of the Office of Community Health Engagement and Resiliency, or co-chair who's given me the opportunity to serve in community and be embedded uh, by serving community uh, every day. It's, a, it's truly a blessing uh, to do this work. Um, and today I think of my Nana Vicenta Orchenta Romero, who uh, worked for many, many years, many decades at the Armory Park Senior Center in Tucson, Arizona, and with our brothers and sisters who crossed the border and looked specifically for Chenta's house, uh, so that they could stay and be fed and so forth and so on. So it's it's uh, with my Nana in mind that I'm really uh, humbled and thank you very much. And thank you all that are on the call today for, for all the work you do in gratitude. Congratulations. And Cassandra, go ahead with our, our last award recipient. Our final awardee is Ivan Silva Moreno our advising manager in the academic services here at the School of Social Work. Ivan is highly skilled and knowledgeable regarding MSW plans of study. He also provides strong leadership to the advisors on his team. His nomination mentions a specific example of this ability to be swift, responsive, and compassionate in assisting a student in emotional distress. Due to Ivan's kind and gentle intervention, we were able to meet the student's needs and progress to a successful outcome. Thanks for your contribution to the school, Ivan, and congratulations on your award. 
Would you like uh, to say a few words? Sure. Uh, first and foremost, thank you for uh, the nomination of the award. And I really want to um, thank my team, actually, my team of advisors. They've been amazing. They're amazing people to work with. And I'm new to my role, but I got to say they've made this job a lot easier than, than, um, than it should have been, really. And thank you to Shanti for his never-ending support. Thank you, Ivan. Dr. Crudup, I turn it back to you to wrap us up. Wow, look at all we did today. What a great time of congratulating our awards and hearing from, about the, the impact that we, social workers are having across the state. Thank, um, this concludes the awards part of our presentation and let's just give all of our award winners another virtual round of applause. Another uh, uh, clap track, please. Um, we'll, we'll make sure next year we get that um, applause track in there. So congratulations to everyone. Um, I wanna take a moment to thank the Social Work Month Awards Committee who had a very difficult job in our most competitive year yet for awards. Um, I also wanna thank uh, Miguel Vieira for bringing this awards ceremony together and putting the pieces together a lot of behind the scenes work and all of the others who work to make this event a reality. Again, remember to join us throughout the last few days of the month um, on social media um, and our last few events that we have coming up. I also would like to thank uh, Professor Siegel for her inspiring keynote. And again, please do keep in touch with us follow us on social media, join us for a training or a conference, come by, say hi, um, and above all, know that you are doing valuable work and making change. The time is always right for social work, but don't forget to take time for yourself. Breathe, make sure you're drinking water, and keep washing those hands. You are amazing. Have a great Social Work Month. Thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you. Thank you everyone.